So he, that's Potiphar, so he left all that he had in Joseph's charge. And because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. Now, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And as she spoke to Joseph, day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her, or to be with her. But, verse 11, one day, when he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was there in the house, she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. Let's stop there, which was the right thing to do, by the way. Let's stop right there. <laughs> Father, we thank you for your goodness to us in Christ. I pray that you'd give us ears to hear and eyes to see and a heart to believe. And Lord, I pray that in this congregation you would take men and women beyond morality. Take us beyond doing right and wrong. Take us to the point where we treasure Jesus Christ above everything and everyone. And so speak to us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. You can read it for yourself. You see that the Bible is current. The Bible is as current as today's headline stories. Let's put it in a 21st century framework. In front of us, in chapter 39, is a boiling sex scandal. A young intern, a powerful, well-placed leader and his wife. And as you read this story, you immediately start to feel the lessons in morality. Lessons in morality that just sort of drop off the page into our lap. Lessons that remind us to be more careful with what we say, be more careful with who you're with, be more careful in what you wear, to be more honorable, to be more respectful. My goodness, to think about what you're doing, who you're with, or what you're saying, to think about a picture you might put on Snapchat or a comment you might place on Facebook or a text that you sin that could have poisonous and lasting and dangerous effects. That's one lesson you could learn from this passage. You can read the story and cultivate lessons for yourself about morality and specifically about sexual morality. But I want to go beyond morals today because morals are not enough. Morals are not Christianity. Certainly we prayed that all of us would have a high moral standard based on our love for God and God's Word, but that is not what it means to be a Christian, to be moral. Morals aren't the point. Morals are a reflection of your heart. And the heart is always the issue. In the story before us, we find the young man, Joseph, his moral actions, the things that he, do, he does in this passage, are a reflection of that which he treasures most. And that treasured possession, which is Jesus Christ, that treasured possession guides his moral actions. Part of what I want to do today, besides having the Lord's Supper in a little bit, Part of what I want to do today is convince you of what Christianity actually is. That Christianity is not just a moral code. 
Christianity is you and I treasuring Jesus Christ above all things and all people. If you were here last week, last week we uh, studied the first six verses. Last week we decided that Christ is the blessing, so this week I want to build on that and then move forward to next week. Today I'd like to span and say that Christ is the blessing and sin is the enemy. Christ is the blessing, sin is the enemy. Now before I get into the body of the message, what I want to do is, what I've done uh, several times before, I'd like to just go back through this passage. Let's just take a few moments and walk through what we read uh, at the beginning of the sermon and just let me just point out a couple of things to you that you might find interesting. Let's expand it, have a little bit of an amplified version of the passage, and then we'll come back and take several lessons from the text. Go back with me to verse 6. Verse 6 is a continuation from last week. Potiphar has left, in verse 6, he left all that he had in Joseph's charge. Things are going well for Joseph. He is a slave still, but he is an important slave. Because of him, the text says that Potiphar has uh, let his mind not be worried about anything at home. The only thing in verse 6 that he thinks about is the food he's got to eat. Man, wouldn't that be good? So because of Joseph, Potiphar has it made. Now, the gears get shifted mid-verse in verse 6. We're told in verse 6 that Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Now, the first passage tells us from verse 1 to verse 6 that Joseph worked hard, that he's a workhorse. But we find out here he not only is a workhorse, he's a little bit of a show horse. <laughs> that he's well built. Walks in the door and you might take a look at him. He's an impressive young man. Can be a little bit of trouble because guess what's going on? He is a good-looking boy. Verse 7, he's coming from 17, 18. He might be 19 or 20. He's been there for some time, verse 7 tells us. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on him. She pulled her eyes out of her head and threw them at that boy. <laughs> I mean, this text is saying she took a long, hard look. Not only did she look at him, verse 7, she looked at him and said, just two words in Hebrew. We have it three here. Lie with me. It's just two words. It's very explicit and very clear what she wanted. Verse 7, lie with me. Now, notice that she uses two words in verse 7 to say what she wants, and Joseph takes an entire paragraph. He gives a little speech in verses 8 and 9. The, the narrator tells us, verse 8, he's not going to do that. He refused, verse 8. And this is what he said, verse 8. Behold, that, that is to say, woman, what is wrong with you? Behold, because of my, listen, because of me, my master, he has no concern about anything. He trusts me. Not only that, he's put everything that he has in my charge. He knows that I'm dependable. Not only that, he is not greater in this house than I am. He is invested in me. Not only that, he has been generous to me. He has given me everything here except you. And there's a good reason behind that. You are his wife. It's a moral lesson right there. He keeps going in verse 9, and he asks a, he asks a rhetorical question. Based on everything I've just told you, how then can I? Commit this wickedness and this sin against God. Well, he got through that temptation. Feels good to get a victory. He got a victory right there. You think that once you get through a temptation, you're done with that. The truth is you're never done. Sometimes the temptations come and you are caught off guard. They hit you. You grit your teeth and get through them, and it feels good to have a victory. Sometimes they're relentless. Verse 10. She spoke to Joseph day after day. In, in Hebrew, it's, the word day is yom, Y-O-M. All it says is yom, yom. Day after day after day. Relentless pressure. 
What she's saying to him, she's, he's a slave. She is his superior. But he wouldn't listen to her. This is good advice right here. He wouldn't listen to her. He also avoided her. He wouldn't lie beside her. He wouldn't be with her. If she's in the house, he's going to be outside. But one day, verse 11, his, his luck seems to have run out. Now, some commentators think he should, have been, he should have known better. He shouldn't have gone in the house. So you're thinking like that. If that's what you're thinking, he shouldn't have gone in the house you're bringing thoughts uh, from the 21st century to the text. They are anachronistic. You, you, can't, you can't do that. The Billy Graham rule, I won't ride in an elevator by myself or in a car by myself with a woman. And that is a good rule. You can't impose that on Joseph. Joseph is a slave. He's got to do what he's told to do. He has obligations in verse 11. He's in the house. One day when he went into the house to do his work, None of the men were in the house, and she caught him by his garment. A double-fisted, she had a hold of his garment. Poor guy, every time he gets a good coat, somebody's tearing it off of him. <laughs> she had a, had a hold of his garment. And she, she pulled him down with that garment, lie with me. And here he, he wormed, he did some jujitsu or something, got out of that shirt, and left it in her hand. It's complete broken arrow right here. It is complete scorched earth. Left it in her hand and ran out of the house. Which is the right thing to do. Next week we'll deal with the rest. Let's pause here and learn some lessons. Let me give you a couple of things I think that believers need to get a hold of. Here's the first one. Number one, you and I, we must be hyper vigilant hyper vigilant i don't mean you just be smart i mean beyond being smart let me, let me show you where, where i get that if you get to the end of verse six and you add that to the beginning of verse seven you put them two together and there's where the flashpoint of the trouble is verse six tells us that joseph is an impressive young man he's already proven he can work hard and his work is successful but verse 6 tells us that on top of that, he walks in the room and he's built like a government mule. And she notices that. He got striking good looks. Now, now pause there and think about Joseph for a moment. Re remember, everything's in context. Think about Joseph. Where did he come from? Joseph's background is he's been kidnapped, abandoned by his family, stripped, Sold like an animal, branded like a slave. It's been a while since somebody looked at him positively. Maybe never has anybody looked at him like Potiphar's wife is looking at him in verse 7. Verse 7 says that after some time she gave him a very clear look. This is an obvious look. This is an overt look. There's no question as to how she's looking at him. It is the kind of look that if someone were looking at you like this, you would notice it. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an objectifying, uncomfortable. The look she's putting on Joseph is letting him know that she wants more than just another glass of tea. Brothers and sisters, now this is this is where men and women, brothers and sisters in Christ, especially in our day and the environment that we live in, it is imperative that we as believers, we live with a heightened sense of awareness, hyper-vigilant. Think I'm making too much of it? Remember what Peter wrote, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8? Peter said, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion and he's seeking someone to devour. Verse, the next verse will say, resist him. Brothers and sisters, a, a hyper-vigilance that stems from our view of the blood of Jesus. Why are we hyper-vigilant? It is because we have this elevated view and value of the blood of Jesus, that we treasure the blood of Jesus at the cross. We'll have the Lord's Supper today. We do this to remember what it took to purchase us. If you are a Christian sitting in here today, 
If you're a Christian, Jesus shed his blood for you. Paul writes it like this. You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Honor God with your bodies. Honor God with what you see. Whatever screen you put in front of your face, whether it is your, your iPhone or your, a tablet of some kind or a computer, what is it? Are you honoring God with what you see or what you hear? Who you're with? Where you go? What about social media, your participation in social media? Or if you're one of those persons that just sort of stalks on social media and you just look at it, are you honoring God with that? You and I must be hyper vigilant. Let me give you another lesson I think we need to learn. Number two, we need to learn contentment. We must learn contentment. The thing that's going to guard your soul the best is you being content. Let's go back to the scene. You'll see her proposition in verse 7. She's made it very clear what she wants. She has basically said, have sex with me. That's what she's saying in verse 7. Lie with me. Lie with me. Let me read verse 7, 8, and 9. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. Verse 8. But he refused and said to his master's wife, behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house. He has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am. I mean, she's made quite a proposition to him in verse 7. And it's almost a command. But when you read verse 8 and then you get into part of verse 9, you get a sense of, of Joseph's settled attitude. Here's what I mean. Although he is a slave, and he doesn't want to be a slave, Although he is owned, he is working in such a way that God is blessing his work and using it for the good of that house that he's in, and he's recounting all that God is doing. There is a real sense of settled attitude in his life. Joseph, look, here's what he's doing. He's looking around him. He looks at all that he has. He looks at all that God has done. He looks at the provision of God in his life. And he rejoices in that. You see, here is a vicious, vicious problem. Most of us here look at what we don't have. And we're upset about our lack. Instead of looking at all that God has done for you. Being grateful for what God has done for you. Oftentimes, if you start, I mean, the American free market has learned this. Car dealers have learned this. What they do is, last year's model was a really good model. Well, next year's model is going to be tweaked just a little bit. You got last year's model. And next year's model is so pretty, it's bothering you so much, you're still in debt with last year's model. But if you'll trade this one in, you'll take that debt, put it on now, and you'll be really upside down. But you'll have that good car until the following year's model comes out. You see, what drives us is the desire to have what we don't have. Go with me over there to Mount Sinai. Moses is standing there hearing from God. He's writing some things on tablets. They turn out to be Ten Commandments. The first several commandments have to do with man's relationship to God. The last several commandments have to do with man's relationship to man. And that tenth commandment is you shall not covet. The reason it's put there on the end is because coveting is a gateway sin. Wanting what we don't have drives us to do all of those other commandments, to break them all. The Apostle Paul spoke about this. It's a verse that a lot of you know. First, uh, it's, it's uh, Philippians chapter 4. If you're an athlete, you probably know Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. You've uh, misused it on t-shirts before. Put it maybe on a tattoo or something. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Did some smelling salts and tried to deadlift 700 pounds. Didn't work. And you're thinking, well, the Bible's not true. Well, it's not that the Bible is not true. It's you misunderstood it. To understand Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, you've got to take it in context. Remember that context. The context of that passage is Philippians chapter 4, verse 12 and 13. And the context is being content in Christ. Let me read it to you. Paul writes, 
I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, of abundance and need. Here's the secret. I can do all of that. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He didn't, Paul didn't think that um, he could score the winning run through Christ who strengthens me. He didn't think he could leap tall buildings or win the lottery. That's not what he's saying. Paul wanted people to know that through the person and the work of Jesus Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, through that and your union with Jesus in faith, well, what he's saying is that true contentment is found in Jesus. Look, brothers and sisters, when, when you are satisfied on the purity of Jesus, you don't get hungry for the trash of this world. We must learn to be hypervigilant. We must learn contentment. Let me give you a third one, number three. We must learn to understand the danger and nature of sin. The nature and the danger of sin. You can see it. You can even feel it in Joseph's little speech. Verse 7, she said, lie with me. Verse 8 and 9, he starts to make a speech. Get to the end of verse 9. You go ahead and look at the end of verse 9. There's a rhetorical question there. You see the rhetorical question in verse 9? How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? James Montgomery Boyce took this little question and broke it apart. He gave us several ways to look at it. I'll just give you two or three. I want you to look at that first word, I. How can I? The first important word in that question in verse 9 is I. How can I do this great wickedness? How can I, who have known the one true God, how could I, I've benefited from his grace. How can I, I've been taught, I know the difference between right and wrong. How could I do this? How could I have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus? How could I do such a wicked thing after all that God has done for me? How could I do that? The next important word is the word do. How could I do that? Do is an action. You see, as long as the temptation is in our minds... There, there's still hope for victory. If it's just right here, you still might get victory over it. Don't forget, temptation itself is not the sin. Temptation is not the sin. In fact, Paul writes about that. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Remember what he writes? This is such a comforting verse. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. Paul's. You are not by yourself. You're not the worst sinner on earth. You're just a sinner. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. Forget about man. Let's talk about God. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, here comes the Lord in his goodness. With the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape. Why? So that you might endure it. You see, right, it's the doing that is the sin. If I do, I have sinned. If I do, the battle is lost. If I do, I, I've said I believed Jesus, but I've denied my profession. I've denied Christ. That brings us to our last, that last phrase in that rhetorical question. How then can I do this wickedness and sin against God. You see it at the end of verse 9? How can I do this wickedness and sin against God? It's important, brothers and sisters, especially, especially in regards to sexual sin. Our, our culture is seeped in it. Sexual brokenness, sexual perversion, and just a whole culture that we're raising children in. And it's important for us to get this. That, that we recognize this as sin. Joseph's saying, this is, this is wicked. It's a, it's a sin against God. If I do that, it's, it's terrible. And it's telling that, that he would say, this is not just a sin against 
Potiphar, this is a sin against God. I mean, that's the bottom line, isn't it? That's, that's how we understand sin. It's against God. Remember when David went off into that sin with Bathsheba and he's confronted in that in Psalm 51 as the record of his confession? And what he says in Psalm 51 is, oh God, it's against you and you alone that I've sinned. And the only hope for forgiveness is found at the cross of Christ. Brothers and sisters, we must be vigilant. We, we must learn contentment in Christ that is such good medicine to keep us from temptation. We must, the third point, or lessons, we must, um, we must understand the danger of sin. Let me give you a fourth lesson I think that you'll see here. Number four, we must learn not to dance with the devil. I didn't know how else to say it. I probably could have come up with a better way, but that sounded good there. We must learn not to dance with the devil. Let me pick up the story and go through it quickly. You'll find him there in verse 10, and the pressure, the relentless pressure is starting to set out on him. Verse 10 says that she spoke to Joseph day after day, day after day after day. Every time he saw her, he tried to avoid her in verse 10. He wouldn't lie with her. He wouldn't be with her. Verse 10 is good advice. You know there's a problem over there? Don't go over there. But she's aggressive. She's putting pressure on him. She's trying to wear him down in verse 10. It'll work with Samson later on and judges. Women will wear him down. But, but you'll notice verse 10 says he wouldn't lie with her, he wouldn't be with her, he wouldn't go close to her. Verse 11, he, he unfortunately has to go to work in a place where he knows there's going to be trouble. The day he went in there, she evidently had lined it up so that all of the men would not be in the house. He had to go there. He has obligations. Verse 12, it happened. She caught him. This is the only time in... Only time in the Bible you ever see a woman act like this. Only time. This is a unique story. It's, in fact, it's against how the Bible usually uh, portrays women in sin. Typically, if a woman is going to entice a man, say Proverbs 5, 6, and 7, it's going to be with how she looks and what she says. She's going to seduce him. And if a man is going to be in, in sexual sin, it's typically he's going to be the aggressor and be, uh, be, be uh, forceful. But the roles are reversed here. You'll never find another woman acting like this in the Bible. This is unique. She takes both hands in verse 12 and with force is pulling him down. Her attack is unique. It catches him off guard. He does the only right thing. Broken arrow. He left his garment and ran out of the house. Brothers and sisters, sometimes the only thing you can do is to run. Get out of there. Use a phrase like this, take me home. Let me tell you, young lady, use the phrase, take me home. I'm calling my father. You don't have a father. Call the church. I'll be your father that day. What did, Paul, what did Paul tell Timothy? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. You've got to run away from it. Flee youthful passions. If you're fleeing from something, 2 Timothy 2, verse 22. Flee youthful passions and then pursue righteousness and faith and love and peace. All of this from a pure heart. I want to close this message before we take the Lord's Supper with one last lesson we need to learn. Number five, all of us are sinners some degree or other, we've sinned. If you're not careful, that sin weighs you down. You need to learn this lesson. We must learn the joy of God's grace. You remember now who Joseph is. Joseph is a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. Joseph is put in the Old Testament to point us to Jesus in the New Testament. And I think you can draw a straight line from chapter 39 all the way to Hebrews chapter Four that describes Jesus. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. This is good news for us. The writer of Hebrews tells us, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, 
but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, and yet he did it without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we might receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Grace. That's what Christianity is. At the cross of Jesus, you find grace. You, you don't actually know how amazing grace is until you have felt the weight of how terrible sin is. You can't sing amazing grace until you've been down in the gutter where sin is. That's what grace is about, pulling, up, pulling us up out. That's what the cross of Jesus did. Brothers and sisters, that's what the Lord's Supper is about. We today close this service by remembering what Christ has done for us on the cross. And because of that in Christ, you are forgiven and you receive grace. Would you join me as we pray? We'll close out the service and then I'll give some instructions on the Lord's Supper. Father, thank you for the grace you've given us in Christ. And I pray, Holy Spirit, you would apply this to the hearts of people here today that need grace. And as we take the Lord's Supper, may we be reminded of how good you are. In Jesus' name, amen.